Celebrate. October 1994, revival broke out here at Presentation BBM Catholic Church in Philadelphia. After three years, we felt it was time to invite Catholics from all over the United States to come and experience revival. And so these videos are truly a gift of the Catholic Revival Conference. for the Lord. Let's just shout with all our voices in praise as we claim the nations for Jesus, for Jesus. Our four-day conference opened on Monday night, and our first guest speaker was the evangelist Rodney Howard Brown, through whose ministry revival has broken out all over the world. How hungry are you for God this week? Well, if you press in and you come, expecting God to touch you. He's going to touch you and He's going to change you and you're never going to be the same again. And when you, if some of you come from other regions, you're going to go back to areas totally changed. People are going to look at you and then they'll say, what's happened to you? Something's happened to you. You're different. You're not the same person that left here. Why, when you left here, you look so sad. But now you look so free. You look so free. And you know what? You'll be able to tell them, joy to the world, the Lord has come. 
I bring you glad tidings of a great joy. You'll be able to bring them the gospel. Hi, baby. Come here. You love Jesus? Lord Jesus. That's it right now. 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 Lift your hands. Right. There it is. Just let them go right through. Just close your eyes. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Operating table. <laughs> Go ahead and let that joy just bubble out your belly. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. More. 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 Don't stop. Just let it bubble. Let it bubble. When the Lord touched me, after that he told me, he said, now I want you to get my people, get them under my anointing. You can stay there, baby, it's fine, you can stay there, it's all right, just sit in the presence of God. It's the anointing of God that's going to make the difference in people's lives. It's the anointing that's going to bind up broken hearts. How many of you here tonight, you carry some grief in your heart, just from things of the past? Tonight, by the Spirit of God, Come here, lady. You've been carrying a lot of grief with you? Yes. You have? For how long? Uh, For quite a few years. Quite a few years. I try to have joy. You try to have joy. And it turns into tears. And it turns into tears. Well, I mean, you can have tears of joy as well, you know. Right. That's part of what this is. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen. Don't be sad anymore. <laughs> be happy. Rejoice. Ha ha ha. down there? <laughs> huh? I can't hear you, lady, huh? What's happening? Huh? That's wonderful. She has a wonderful testimony right now. To you. On the following three days of the conference, there were morning sessions which were highlighted by the daily teachings. In the evening, there was a liturgy with the homily given by Father Thomas D. Lorenzo of the Archdiocese of Boston. This first daily teaching focuses on the important powers that are contained in revival. There are different things that we do. And I'll t when we pray with someone, we're going we're gonna to invite in a moment those who I uh, have not yet yielded to laughter to come up. Some of you will yield, some of you will not. That's all right. No worry. And what we'll do, we'll just going to pray in the anointing tongue. Also, we put, we pray, uh, put hands on your stomach. Now, with women, we just ask them to put your hand on your stomach. So I'll be, like, touching your hand. I'll be doing different things, uh, okay, and uh, sometimes praying in your ear, whatever has to be done. Okay, and uh, with men, we'll just don't, we'll put their hands on our stomach, we'll pray on, so, and some of you will yield, some won't, some will just have a beginning yield, it takes time, it breaks through, okay, some break through right away. Do, 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 Don't 
This reading is from Mark chapter 6, verse 53. After making the crossing, they came ashore at Genezareth and tied up there. As they were leaving the boat, people immediately recognized him. The crowd scurried about the adjacent area and began to bring in the sick on bedrolls to the place where they heard Jesus was. Wherever Jesus put in an appearance, in villages, in towns, or at crossroads, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him to let them touch just the tassel of his cloak, and all who touched him got well. In Jesus' ministry, there are three uh, realities, uh, the crowd, the powers, and the reality of who Jesus was. And that's going to be our topics. Today, we're going to talk about the crowds and the powers of revival. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about the reality of revival, what is revival, and we'll examine some tomorrow some of the terms, the terms like move of God, anointing, and higher realms of the Holy Spirit. On the third morning, we're going to talk about that every revival has a prehistory and also has a goal. Okay? And then the, so today, we're going to talk about the power, the people, and the powers. Primarily, we're going to talk about the powers, but first I'd like to t talk a little bit about the crowds. Because often in the Gospels, uh, there's, we skip over some of, the, uh, some of the things as if, well, they're not really that important. Okay? And one important part of Jesus' ministry is the crowds. In the Gospels, often they talk about the size of the crowds, talk about the enthusiasm of the crowd. The crowd tried to make him king. The disillusionment sometimes of the crowd where Jesus said, you came here seeking bread, you don't come for the real food. The rejection of the crowd, is this not the son of Joseph? Is, isn't this the carpenter's son? Don't we know where he lived? Okay. Sometimes there's the all. Throughout Mark's gospel, there is the all and the wonder. Okay, who is this? And of course, Mark is deliberately using the crowds to build up the purpose. There is opposition that comes from the crowds. There is a design to kill Jesus. Sometimes it's said they could not capture him publicly due to the crowds. And, of course, there's the Palm Sunday crowd. Now, the crowds got misinterpreted by the apostles as the phenomena. They, they would say, you know, who's going to be first? Who's going to get the first place in front of the crowds? Okay. However, it would be wrong to underestimate and to downplay the role of crowds in Jesus. As we look at the revival that broke out at Pentecost, there too we see the crowds. Okay. It says 3,000 on Pentecost Day. And then when the lame man got healed, there were 5,000. The news spreads quickly. And then up in Samaria, it says revival breaks out as uh, there's as loud cries and healings and all. And people then began to tell other people. Okay. And Jesus' dream is of the crowds. Jesus is not some, some esoteric person who only is interested in his small little group. Jesus says, go, teach all nations, making everyone a disciple. Okay. And so there are people. Revival is not just people. Revival is not just an idea whose time has come. Revival is not just a buzzword, although it's now many, many books appearing, revival here, revival there. Revival is not just the latest spiritual fad. Okay? We have to realize that here at Presentation, we've been into revival for three years. Okay? So three years we've been coming, and God's been with us for three years. So it's not just a fad. And we could say to people, look, this is not just a fad. This is not just going to pass away. Because what's happening here are the phenomena are actually growing. Okay, they're actually breaking out. They're breaking out here in greater and greater depths. Okay? And the phenomena also are breaking out all over the world. Okay? So we, we have reports. People contact us, say, you know, what's going on there? It happened here. It happened here. It took place here. And so what's happening is the revival phenomenon are breaking out all over the world. But re if revival were just people, then it could fade away as quickly as it came, you know, like it happens in the secular world. So, something is suddenly important, and then the next year, it's out of, out of kilter. But a revival with no people is no revival at all. So people are very important to revival. And I want to say this here. 
you are very important. You are extremely important. You are an extremely important part of revival. When Alicia told, told the widow with her jug and she needed something, she was going to, to raise her family, he said, go and get all the other jugs. And so they went and they brought all the jugs in. And it says as long as there were jugs, then the oil continued to flow from her one little jug. And she said she filled all the vessels. And then it says when there were no more vessels, the oil, oil dried up. Okay. So God is pouring out revival. You, what we're going to tell you these days you, are phenomena. There are powers that we're going to try to share with you in the little time that we have. God is doing a wonderful thing. But if there are no jugs to receive the oil, then it's going to be a waste. And on the final day, we're going to be talking about uh, the prehistory of revival. We're going to show that revivals fail. And many, many revivals have failed because there weren't any people. There were people. Okay, so people are extremely important to revival. In 1994, fall of 94, when the revival broke out, we had like 25 people. Next week we had about 30, you know. Then things began to happen. Word began to get out. We began to have to bring chairs over there. The meeting began at 8 o'clock, and by quarter of 8, the 60 chairs there were filled. And then they kept going out. Okay? And even when we were just 50 or 60 people, I had to say to them, you are very important. This might be the only place in the Catholic Church that understands revival. This might be the only place in the Catholic Church where the fire revival has fallen. So I look and all I had were 50 to 60 people. It's just like Jesus looked around. That's all we had were the disciples, Peter, Abraham, Andrew, James, John. Okay, that's all we had. And they were the ones who took the message. And so I had to say to the, to the 50 people that were there, you are very important. Okay, and of course they were faithful. And the Lord constantly says that the only reason this revival is still is is flowing and the fire is going is because of the fidelity of the people okay and they were faithful and they kept coming we hit 90 people began to go up the steps out in the dining room and that's when I said I unfortunately I can't meet here anymore and that's where we had to move over here we moved over here in February of 1995 with 90 people and I said how am I going to run a prayer meeting in a church that holds 700 with 90 people also they're not looking at one another we're not facing one another we try to figure out one time we had them in both sides sometimes we had them here but that didn't stop the revival there were newcomers we we have never had a prayer meeting in t in three years with less than 15 newcomers every some every every single week there's 15 <laughs> to 20 at least newcomers here we have we have also in three years never had a prayer meeting without the phenomena we have never had a prayer meeting where laughter did not break out and where dormition especially the laughter would take place and all the other phenomena we have not had a single prayer meeting we would we wouldn't know how to have a prayer meeting without laughter I'm not kidding you. I would not know how to run a prayer meeting where there was no laughter Okay, where there was no, none of the phenomena that is usually associated with revival. That's how God has so blessed this place. But he's blessed it because of the people, and the people kept coming. And then we hit 200 in February 95. We hit 300. I'm sorry, in July of 95, we hit 200. July of 96, we hit 300. July of 97, we hit 400. At our masses, uh, we, we now had to go and add another mass. So we now have mass on the first Sunday and the third Sunday. And on those Sundays, we'll get an extra 100, 150 people. So there'll be five, 500 to 550 people here at our masses, right? So that, but what happens, it's all, it's all the fidelity of the people. There would have been no revival without the fidelity of the people. Okay? And that's why you're so important. God has touched you, brought you here. Okay, you're, you're just trying to get filled as a vessel. Okay, you'll go back. I don't, okay, so what's going to happen is the revival fires are going to just start flashing all over the United States in the Catholic Church. Okay, and I, we hope here during these morning sessions that you get enough teaching and enough anointing. Okay, that when you go back, you'll, you'll be just what the Lord wants. And there's excitement among the people. Okay, I can see what happened here at the people of presentation. Okay, the heart, now, the heart of revival is the meeting. It's important that people in revival not be scattered. Okay. 
that the meeting itself is the revival. Uh, down in Pensacola, they said they have all these seminars, this teaching, but the seminars don't mean anything because it's the meeting that's so important. So what we found is the joy in the meeting. Okay. So what happened, as we go along, we realize the Lord is calling us to joy. We met Christmas night. Christmas night we were here. Okay. New Year's Eve, 9 to 12 to, to 12.30, we were here with hundreds and hundreds of people. We decided to have nine nights of prayer. Okay, now most people would think nine nights of prayer, by nine nights of prayer, you're really going to be tired. By nine nights of prayer. We went from the Ascension to the Vigil of Pentecost, nine nights. The Vigil of Pentecost was a, a Holy Ghost blowout here. It, it was one of the most powerful, okay, okay, in our, okay, in our. Okay. An another gift that the Lord has given to us with our young adult, we have a young adult prayer group. Okay, now just, are you ready? Hold your seats. We have a young adult prayer group that started in 1984. Okay, it's never been real, real big. It's boys and young men and young women, 18 to 35, single and married. We have six priests ordained for the Archdiocese of Philadelphia from our young adult prayer group. Okay? Okay. Okay. We will have three more priests ordained this year from the young adult prayer group. We, okay, and we will have a priest ordained every single year from now on. And we have more going into, in this year, all from a little group, the young adult prayer group that the Lord, and that's what happened on the Vigil of Pentecost. The ordination was that, that morning, and Father Jim Otto, who started at our young adult retreat, and then came to the young adult prayer group, and then a year later realized God was calling him to St. Charles Seminary. There. But we met for nine nights. I, I'd wake up in the morning, and I'd say, okay, I work hard till 7.30, and at 7.30 I go over and I have my revival meeting. It was the most joyful mornings in my whole life. I'd wake up, I got my revival meeting, till, and there we would be. We'd be everywhere about 120 at minimum, 150, 160 people every single night for nine nights, and, and it was wonderful, the, and the conclusion was unbelievable. Okay. See, some might wonder, how long is God going to throw this spiritual party okay, that he's been having for three years? How long is he going to do it? And he, I'd say this, he's going to do it as long as people keep showing up, okay? Because God's parties don't end. His parties don't end, all right? They don't end. The only time when the, the, the party ends, the party ends when the people stop showing up. Of course the party's over. God didn't end the party. You ended the party. You stopped showing up. Okay? And as long as we keep showing up, God's going to keep throwing his party. There was a prophecy here given from this microphone by a, man, a young man named John Banker. And he, as he said, this prophecy, we had just sort of moved over to the church. And he said, stay around, stay around, stay around, because you will see this church filled. Now, as I heard it, I thought, well, I, I, I hope it's going to happen. Okay? It might happen. Okay? Okay? And I have seen, okay? I have seen. Last night, you saw 1,200 people here. Okay? That's how, many, that's how many we had, our largest crowd, right? Okay. But it's common, it's common now, it's common for this church to be filled. And there's a bonding among the people, okay? And, and the people say this, we would never go back. Now, that's not a proud statement. It's just a joy statement. That, that what God has done has just been unbelievable. And there's, there's a beauty and there's a quality. There's a quality to the meeting. Okay, and then uh, when people come from afar, they'll often stop in. People will drive up from Maryland or, or South Carolina sometimes. Jack, for Florida, they come up for our Wednesday night prayer meeting. That's why, in, in a sense, this conference is due to their fidelity because people were coming from New York, driving up from Carolina, driving up from, and I said, well, look, if they're coming up and they're coming, I don't want, all they could do is come up and we, we just have a Wednesday night meeting. I said, well, then we have to have something, something longer for them so that this conference is really the result of their fidelity. So you see that revival is really very, very much people who are faithful. Okay? And when people would come, I wouldn't have to say to them, well, you didn't really see revival tonight. Come back next month. Okay? We really have a wonderful speaker coming in or something like that. I, all I would say to them is, what you saw tonight was not special. It was just what we do every single week. And I'll say this, what you saw last night was not special. Okay, you might have thought it was special. That is what we have every single time that we come together, right? right? All, okay. all, all, 
all that we had last night was a few more people at the party, but the party was the same. We serve the same wine every single time we come together. It's the new wine of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay? No change in the wine, some a little higher quality. Sometimes the Lord does things. Unfortunately, with people, sometimes there's opposition. Honestly, some people call me demonic. They call me demonic. Can you imagine that? I led them in the Holy Spirit in charismatic renewal from 1971, took them down. They led them with God's grace down to the spectrum. We rented the spectrum two years. We went three days to the convention hall for about seven, eight years. We went four years out to the big Villanova DuPont Pavilion, had our biggest crowd in 1990 when I stepped down. I led them for 25 years in the Holy Spirit. They come here to one meeting and they say, Monsignor Walsh is into the demonic. I haven't seen a demon since revival broke out. I tell you, because they don't dare, they don't dare come around. Hallelujah. They don't come around. The revival. There's no demons. We don't, okay, there's no demons. They don't even bother showing up. They say, they say, presentation, I'm not going to get near presentation. The revival, there's a new wine. There's a new, there's a new wine at presentation. Don't go near. I'm saying, okay, Satan says, look, Presentation is out of bounds because, because presentation is out of bounds, uh, Satan says. Because every demon I send over there, they get drunk. They get drunk. <laughs> and they're no good to me. They're no good to me at all. Okay? Now, sometimes, sometimes people call revival divisive. Oh, you're going to divide everything. Listen, every gift of God is divisive. Because some take it and some refuse to take it. So every single gift of God is divisive, okay? Even Jesus was divisive. And he said, I've come, I've come, and, and I tell you, I will divide. And I will divide father from son and mother from daughter and mother-in-law from daughter-in-law, okay? And what he was saying, what, what is in that gospel is what was happening. That is, people in, some, in families, especially Jewish families, okay, many of them were, were turning to Jesus. Okay, and then the family was divided. Okay, and so people could say, look, don't, don't take that gift, it's divisive. Oh, that's divisive, don't take revival. Revival is divisive. Sometimes I get accused of dividing the prayer groups here. I haven't moved from this parish. I haven't gone to any prayer group. I haven't spoken. I spoke about three weeks after the revival broke out. I had been invited to, to a charismatic meeting. I kept that, and I went and I spoke, and that's where Father Ed Cahill, got drunk in the spirit. He couldn't move off the pew after the talk. He couldn't move for 20 minutes, and then he broke out in laughter. Okay, and that's, but that's the only place I have spoken since rev I, the revival break out. I don't want to cause any division. I, I have no desire to cause any division. I don't want to cause any division. But gifts are divisive because God gives them, and, and some people take them, and some people don't take them. And so you have... You don't realize, we, you know, as Catholics, we look at the Duquesne weekend, February 1967. Okay, what happened there, and we'll get into this, we go into the prehistory of revival. There was a group that was hungering and thirsting. The group then went off on the weekend, okay, and then on Saturday night, the phenomena broke out, the praying in tongues, the baptizing in the spirit, and then the men who had gone to the prayer meeting of Elizabeth Dodge began to explain what had happened to them, that they had understood praying in tongues, okay? Now, well, why isn't charismatic renewal centered at Duquesne? Because Duquesne didn't want it. That's the story. The, the group went back, and the people had baptism spirit, had praying in tongues. We know they're real gifts now. It's 30 years later. We know we celebrate 30th anniversary. They got thrown off the campus. They didn't want praying in tongues. They didn't want baptism of the Spirit at Duquesne. They didn't want it. The group didn't want it. Okay? Some were all upset. You're dividing our group. My God, they didn't know the gift that they had. They had a gift that was going to touch millions and millions of people. So the Holy Spirit is a dove. He's very, very, a dove, you know, is very sensitive. And if you don't want him, he's going to fly away. If you don't want him, he's not going to stay around. Okay? Okay? So some people say it's divisive. No, you've got to understand, there's a gift here. Okay. When, when, when laughter broke out in our prayer group, we had some division, just a little bit. 
okay, but most of them, you know, and, and, I, and I had to say, well, I, I can't help it. The gift that, it, that, we, that God has given to us is so important that if you want, there's a prayer group in the next parish. They don't laugh, okay? And, and you can go over to that prayer group because they don't laugh, okay? You know what happened? The priest from that parish got involved in the revival. <laughs> and, okay. 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 Now let's, let's move into the heart of this talk. The powers of the revival. See, so, some would wonder, see, Jesus had many powers. He had the healing, he had miracles. He walked on water, he multiplied bread. He cast out Satan, and even his preaching was power. And then he'd say, oh, no one teaches in authority like this. Okay. So the, the, an important part, if you took scissors, some people don't like healings, they don't like miracles. Well, if you took a pair of scissors and cut out all the, all the miracles and all the healings out of the gospel, you couldn't make sense of it. Okay? John's gospel is centered around the miracles. All the teachings in John's gospel are centered around the miracles of Jesus. He does a miracle, and then, the, then there's a long teaching about what is the meaning of this miracle. So if you cut them all out so that the powers of Jesus are very, very important. Well, some, some would wonder about, some would call this charismania. Oh, aren't you just seeking new powers? You know, they say, look, Monsignor, you know, 25 years ago, you liked tongues, you got into tongues, you got into prophecy. Now you found out laughter. Now you're all over, running all over laughter. They miss, they miss the point. Keeping alive the charisms, keeping alive the phenomena, a continuous yielding to the phenomena is the most difficult spiritual task there is. That's the toughest job. Even the New Testament church couldn't do it. The, the charisms obviously were di dying out in the latter part of the New Testament. You don't read anything about healing and all in the letters to Timothy or Titus. All you hear about is doctrine and passing on a doctrine, which is all important. But even the New Testament church could not live up to the spiritual demands. Okay. Not seeking spiritual powers is often spiritual laziness. You're lazy. You say, oh, I don't like tongues, I don't like this, I don't like this prophecy, I don't like this. You're lazy. Okay? Because it takes a lot. It also takes an awful lot to keep the flame of charisms alive. It takes an awful lot of pastoral work. It takes an awful lot of yielding to the Spirit. It also means that the, the leaders and the people, okay, and it's the same way with revival. Okay? Revival is a whole new level. Okay? It, 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 it is not as much work as charismatic renewal, but it requires a great, much greater degree of sensitivity. Also this, you talk about, well, you're seeking the powers, you're seeking the gifts. Or, or, listen, if I love the people, if I have compassion for them, if I see them as sheep without a shepherd, if I see people who need to be healed, who need to be delivered, who need God's word preached in the power of the Holy Spirit, then I should seek God's powers. And if, and if I don't, then I'm cheating the people. If I don't seek God's powers, then I'm cheating the people. And if I don't, if I don't seek God's powers, then I'm under the conclusion that my powers are enough. Okay. Okay. I go around, if I don't seek the powers of God, okay, then, I, I, then logically I'm saying that I, I got enough power, that I can feed the 5,000. That, I, that I, can, I can do everything. Don't worry, Lord. You're okay, Lord. Look, Lord, you just stay in heaven. Just keep your Holy Spirit. I'll take care of this parish. I'll do everything. Don't worry, Lord. I got it all together. I went to the seminary. I got my, my master's in divinity. I got my MDiv. Okay, I might even have a doctorate. I'm okay, Lord. I went through all those seminary courses. I know exactly. I studied my liturgy. Okay, Lord, you don't have to worry about a thing. This parish is in great hands. Okay, don't worry about a thing. Okay. Because if I don't seek God's powers, then logically I'm saying that my powers are enough. Okay? And, and I, think, I think every priest in this church has, has spent time in their ministry when they tried to feed the 5,000 and you find out it's no good. Okay, they're awful hungry of failure. You wonder, you're stretched out. Okay, you're, you're disappointed. You feel your failure. You're, you're, everything's wrong. Other people might say, well, look, um, I have charismatic powers, 
Why do I need revival powers? Don't I have the Holy Spirit? Am I talking against the baptism of the Spirit? No. Because we've held on to everything that's in charismatic renewal. We've held on to every gift of charismatic renewal. We still pray in tongues. We yield to prophecy, healing, and we're going to try to maybe try to get to tell you some of the many healing stories. Healings are all over the place. Okay, the power of healing is all over the place in revival. Stories that I've never had, never had in charismatic renewal. But if I, let's say I have charismatic powers, why do I need revival powers? Well, that's to be satisfied with what God did 20 years ago. Okay. God's doing a new thing. Okay. So sometimes, sometimes I'm content with human powers, or sometimes I'm content with what God did 20 years ago. It's to refuse the invitation to go from glory to glory. You'll so find out that's a key text that in the revival. You go from glory to glory to glory. Okay. And here's the real thing about the powers and the phenomena. In 1971, I joined Charismatic Renewal. There was a wonderful brother, Pancratius, who came in 1970 and founded the Re Renewal here in Philadelphia. And brother... Okay, brother, we're going brother Pank again. Okay. Okay. And as I joined in 1971, and then people realized I was involved, and we began to hold teachings. We were over at St. Charles Seminary. We had a big teaching for priests and sisters. And I remember right after that teaching, okay, things were starting to move in charismatic renewal, standing on the steps of St. Charles Seminary. And I said, brother, I said, how can we be sure that this movement of charismatic renewal will grow. And without batting an eyelash, he turned and he said, Father, use the gifts. Just use the gifts, and the movement will grow. And that's, that is the secret of Philadelphia charismatic renewal. And Philadelphia charismatic renewal grew, and it grew, and it grew, until we were renting large and gigantic stadiums. And it continued to grow. And we had to continue to use large and gigantic stadiums. We used large and gigantic stadiums beginning in 1977 and continuing into the 1990s. But the secret was use the gifts. Okay? That's the secret. Okay? And that's the same way with revival. You've got to use the phenomena. You've got to let the phenomena flow. You've got to let the laughter flow. You've got to let the other phenomena that we're going to talk about, the manifest presence of God, the, the laying on hands, you've got to let those phenomena grow. Okay, you've got to let them flow because that's the secret of revival. There is no revival without people. There are no revival. There's no revival without the revival phenomena. Okay, and the, the question is, well, then, why are movements of the Spirit accompanied by phenomena? It's the Holy Spirit, stupid. It's the Holy Spirit, stupid. Okay. And, and the thing is that the Holy Spirit is not stupid. Okay. See, there, are two, there have been two sendings of, of a divine person upon this planet. The first was Jesus when the Father sent the Son and the angel came. And, and Jesus took a human nature of Mary and there was the wonderful mystery of Christmas, and the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Then there is the second sending, where the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit did not take a human nature like Jesus. He did not ask Mary, give me a, a human nature, but rather the Holy Spirit takes, he joins himself to us. The Holy Spirit joins his spirit to us, our spirit. So the Holy Spirit manifests himself through us. A Holy Spirit who doesn't manifest himself becomes a forgotten person. Okay. That's what happens. If the Holy Spirit doesn't manifest himself, then he becomes a forgotten person. And the Holy Spirit has decided that he will only manifest himself through cooperative human persons. That's his plan. If, if, and that's his plan. If, if persons don't cooperate, then he will not manifest himself. He will, if, if there are people who are not cooperative, then he just will not manifest himself. Or rather, what he's going to do, he's going to offer his gift to others. That's what's going to happen. If, if, people, if people refuse to receive the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit is just going to move on. He's going to manifest himself but he's just going to go to others, okay? And, and that's why 
And that's why this, this conference is so important. It's, that's, I, don't, I don't want this revival flowing outside of the Catholic Church. That's, that's what I'm all about. That's what I'm all about. Because the Pentecostal movement began in 1900. The power of Pentecost began when Pope Leo XIII, under the guidance of Blessed Elena Guerra, Blessed Elena Guerra told Pope Leo that God wanted, wanted him to dedicate the 20th century to the Holy Spirit. And on, on, Jan, on December 31st, 1900, which is really the turn of the century, December 31st, 1900, January 1st, 1901, when Pope, Saint, Pope Leo invoked the Holy Spirit upon the whole world for the 20th century, it came down upon the world in a little farmhouse in Topeka, Kansas, which is now, uh, that place is now a Roman Catholic church dedicated to our mother, our mother Mary. That's where, that's what, that's where, that's where modern Pentecostalism began. Agnes Osmond prayed in tongues. The whole Bible college began to pray in tongues and Charles Parham became the apostle of Pentecost and he began to go all through the whole United States talking about praying in tongues, talking about the new Pentecost. One of his disciples was William Seymour down in, in Parham's Bible College in Texas. Seymour was touched, went out to Los Angeles, began the Azusa Street Revival in 1905, 1906, 24 hours a day. People from all over the world came and that began the Pentecost. That was from the prayer of Pope Leo XIII. But it wasn't until 1967 that Pentecost then entered the Catholic Church. That's when the Pente Catholic Charismatic Renewal finally became part of the stream of modern Pentecostalism. So it took 67 years, 67 years to be, to be touched by that stream. Okay. And that's, that's why this conference is so important. That's what we're dedicated to, that these revival phenomena that are now all over the world, that it doesn't take 67 years for it to get into the Catholic Church. Okay? That we want, in fact, what's astounding, and, and Rodney said it last night out in the parking lot to me, he said it to me before, what's astounding? people cannot believe that a Catholic Church is into revival. They, they cannot, the Protestant ministers who were here, they cannot believe that the Catholic Church is into revival. They can't believe that this is, that this is going on, okay? And that's why this conference is so important, so that, so that the power of the revival can just get into the Catholic Church early. Okay? See, the, reason, the reason for the phenomena is that the, when the Holy Spirit is real, and for the first time that people spoke in tongues, was on Pentecost Day. In Mark's Gospel, there's one reference to the fact that the, in the future, believers will speak in tongues. Okay, it's a future. But what happened is Jesus deliberately held back. It seems that the tongues were held back until Pentecost Day because Jesus says, I am going to send you the Holy Spirit. As Rodney said last night, wait, just wait in Jerusalem. Now, how could they ever tell that they received the Holy Spirit? Well, one of the reasons was they began to pray in tongues, okay? And all through the Acts and the Apostles with the Gentiles, Cornelius, with the disciples of John in chapter 19, the tongues were always a sign of Pentecost. So the, the reason is simple. When Jesus sends his Holy Spirit, he wants everyone to say, yes, the Holy Spirit is really here. The Holy Spirit ushered in the final age, okay? And so people wouldn't think that it's a promise as well, it's just a buzzword, it's just a clever phrase. We're going all around, everybody's saying, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Isn't it wonderful we got the Holy Spirit? Rather, tongues showed the reality. It showed that something really happened. Now, it's the same way I'm going around and others are going around saying, revival is here. Revival is here. Okay, well, that's wonderful. Is that just a buzzword? What do you mean by revival? Okay, and that's the importance of holy laughter. 
the importance of holy laughter is, is the way the Spirit says, what I'm doing is new. There's a new level. There's a new power. And that's what holy laughter is. Now, when, when we got into charismatic renewal, there were people who had prayed in tongues. There were some people who came to a prayer group, and as they experienced tongues, they said, wait a minute, I've, I've been doing that for 10 years. I, I don't know what, didn't know what it was. I was out there singing and praising the Lord, and I decided to just to try. And, and so a number of people prayed in tongues before charismatic renewal. But the widespread gift of praying in tongues was a sign to everyone that a new Pentecost had come, that the Pentecost that Pope John had prayed for was here. Now, it's the same way with laughter. Okay, so when you go and you say to everyone there's a revival, okay, then they the, the say, well, what do you mean revival? We say, well, there's holy laughter okay, that's going on. There were people whom I know who had holy laughter before revival came. One of them was Father Bob Pharisee. He teaches it in the Gregorian. Uh, I had him in, I've had him in every year, every other year. His schedule is able to be there at the priest group. His first year that he came in was 1978, and he told his witness story. His witness story was that he went to a conference, a theology conference, uh, at the behest of his friend, Father Sullivan, over there in Rome. And Father Sullivan said, look, uh, not many are coming. Could you come and sort of fill in? And also, I need somebody to open the door. So he said, fine, I'll fill in. I'll open the door. So he opened the door. He filled in. And he sat there in the back. And this was supposed to be a theology conference. However, those who were giving the papers, instead of giving their prepared theology, they began to give their witness stories. And Father Bob Pharisee is sitting back there saying, this is the worst theology I've ever heard. Where did these people ever get their theology? But by the end of the day, he was also saying, what they have, I got to get to. And with that, he ran up on the stage, got a hold of the couple people, and, and said, you got to pray over me. You got to pray over me. And, say, and they said, wait a minute, you didn't go through life in the spirit seminars. You go through life in the spirit seminars? You didn't go through, I can't go. No. And he said, I don't care what seminar, you got to pray over me. With that, he forced them right then and there to pray over him for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? He, he didn't, he experienced some things. A couple, couple months later, he, was, he, he, he knew something was happening and hadn't broke forth yet. So uh, he was over at uh, Father Jim Furry's uh, house, Covenant House, Covenant, uh, Covenant Station, Convent Station, and they were doing a, a retreat, and they started talking about healing of memories, and he was there at lunch. And they're talking about healing of memories, and Bob said, that's exactly what I need. So they said to them the same way, you got to pray over me for healing of memories. They said, wait a minute, we got to go give a talk. No, you can't. You got to pray over me for healing of memories. They prayed over him for healing of memories. He went up to his room. Everything broke open, and he then began to have holy laughter. He could not stop laughing. The laughter came. The laughter came. The laughter came. It kept coming for months and months, okay? And he, he went back to Rome. He went back to Rome. One of his Jesuit friends says, Bob, you know, something's mentally wrong with you. And he said, what do you mean? He says, you're too happy. You're not supposed to be that happy. And, and I have to tell you that I reported you to the superior. You are too happy. And so he went to the superior. The superior said, Bob, you got reported. He says, I don't know what's going on, so I'm going to send you for psychiatric evaluation. Right? So he went for psychiatric evaluation, of course it was okay, and there he was. So he was just, there was just a tremendous gift of holy laughter that has stayed with him So from the beginning. So I knew about holy laughter in 1978. In 1984, when we began that young adult prayer group, there were 12, 12 uh, young adults there. Sister and I met with them. We were trying to discern what to do, and that's where we came up with the idea of starting a once a month prayer group. And there was a girl by the name of Eileen. And while we're praising the Lord, Eileen goes into holy laughter. I mean holy laughter, just like you and I have. Holy laughter. And all the rest, they sort of looked embarrassed. They didn't know how we were going to take it. And they sort of said, uh, you know, Monsignor, um, Eileen, she, she gets this gift. Okay, just don't, don't, you know, it doesn't, the rest of us are sane, you know, but she gets this gift. Holy laughter. It was a wonderful gift. Holy laughter. Off she would go. And every prayer meeting that we had, Eileen would be there, and at some point, three or four times in the middle of the prayer meeting, she'd get into holy laughter. We didn't think it was demonic. We didn't say, you're a demon. Not, okay? Or we just say, go right ahead. Go right ahead and laugh. But what we didn't know was that it was going to be universal. We just thought Eileen had it. Okay? We, okay? So that, so that the, the holy laughter existed before revival. But what the Holy Spirit is doing is he is just giving it, pouring out holy laughter. In other words, God... 
God has upped the ante. He's reached into his pocket and he's pulled out new signs and new, and new wonders. Okay, and that's what the Lord has done. And he just pulled out new signs, new wonders. He just poured them out. And that's what's happening. That's what's happening in the revival. Which is, and, and that's what we've been living in. Once Rodney asked me, he said to me, uh, how can these phenomena be accepted by the Catholic Church? I said, oh, we, I said, we have a whole tradition. He said, you have a whole tradition? I said, yeah. St. Teresa of Avila calls it holy madness. Holy madness, spiritual intoxication. Okay, it's all, it's all in, in St. Teresa of Avila and in our mystical tradition. Amen, hallelujah. I guess we had enough for today. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Great effort to be here for such a long time. But you see now how you have grown, and I will let you grow more and more and more in the power of my spirit. So just be free, just be free.